All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming here. Uh, I'm not going to be selling, you know, Bastion on stage. The goal is really establishing today kind of like the list of challenges that are ahead of us uh, as part of building a stable coin payment ecosystem. I'm going to be defining what are um, the entities that are part of the, uh, the ecosystem. I'm going to go through the main challenges and what we see as kind of the, the main ways to really, um, you know, get past those, mitigate essentially those risks, and really opening the doors to create really um, the future of money um, with programmable money. So um, let's start with setting the baseline. Something that I think I'm, I'm hearing very often, especially at uh, conferences, is the fact that people are pushing for decentralization and, and self sovereignty and a lot of things. And the reality is that the vast majority of the, the people or the businesses uh, really just don't care about it. They care about having money that is accessible, that just works, that is uh, cheap to transfer, that allows them to connect very broadly with people in other businesses. And that's, that's what we should be focusing on. And I think that um, so long as we start from this principle, um, a lot of roadblocks will actually be um, a lot easier to get past, whether that's on the regulatory side, on the banking relationships, and, and many other integrations um, you know, throughout kind of all, the, all the things that uh, Stablecoin touches as part of the, the ecosystem. So um, let's kick it off with just kind of like setting the best line in terms of you know, the, the, the evolution, I would say, of money. Um, money supply has really evolved over time, starting with just uh, paper money and, 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 and coins, and especially held by uh, banking uh, institutions, um, then evolved, uh, and we call it M0. It's the most liquid form of money. Then evolved towards M1, uh, sometimes referred to as uh, narrow money. So it's a little bit uh, less liquid, but still uh, pretty liquid, including um, you know deposits uh, held at banks and um, uh, including kind of like commercial banks, not just central banks and others. Uh, and then M2 is kind of uh, an expansion around that. Then includes uh, you know less liquid. Uh, less liquid money, and that includes saving accounts, uh, short-term uh, deposits, uh, and retail uh, money market funds. And what we're seeing is that there is a huge demand, essentially, to have the structure of the global money supply to evolve and to include, actually, different types of assets that can actually be uh, structured as uh, collateral or backing for money so that it can be transferred faster and cheaper around the world. And having the type of interactions that you can have with the money really be programmable for different use cases, right? And this is why I think everyone is so excited about the, the future of stablecoins is that it doesn't really need to replace a lot of the things that are out there. It just needs to improve them to make them more modular uh, and to make them more programmable. Um, we just kind of like uh, providing some, some uh, context on Bastion. So we are um, a regulated wallet infrastructure provider, and a lot of our customers are actually companies that build uh, stablecoin-related uh, use cases, uh, really mo moving money, whether that's domestically or uh, globally, uh, for faster and cheaper than the alternative rails. And the three things I would say that we see the most uh, focus on and the most work on is uh, first, B2B payments and remittances, so really just replacing very, uh, very expensive and slow uh, money corridors, uh, whether that's from business to business or whether that's from person to person. Separately, we see a lot of businesses that are actually pretty excited about increasing the, uh, the types of assets that they accept as forms of payment. We actually saw earlier today Louisiana uh, being the first state in the U.S. accepting crypto as a way for um, you know, people resident in uh, Louisiana to pay for government services in stablecoins, which is extremely uh, encouraging for us, I would say. Um, but yeah, so checkout and payment acceptance from... Um, from merchants, uh, and we're seeing a lot of increase around that. Very excited. And then finally, global payroll providers. Um, not sure if anyone here has been using uh, Deal or you know Deal. For uh, just a, an example, um, 
but they're uh, seeing an immense amount of growth just because they support businesses to hire globally, right? Whether that's for contractors, whether that's for employees. And payroll is actually extremely expensive to do uh, globally. And there's a lot of interest for much cheaper, uh, essentially, money movements around those uh, salaries for uh, contractors and, and employees globally so that the employee can actually have an additional you know, 3%, 4%, sometimes 5% uh, globally. So those are kind of like the three things that, that we see the, the most worked on. But it is extremely hard. And part of it is due to the, 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 the size of the touch points, the amount of touch points that uh, stable coins have. So everything that you see here is actually not, not even an exhaustive list. There are actually a lot more entities, parties that are um, that are actually working uh, to make stable coins payments work, uh, so, some more than others. <laughs> you may uh, notice uh, you know, central banks that might not see always kind of like stable coins in, in the best regard, but um, all of them are included as part of this uh, effort, whether it's um, parties that, we need, that are actively working on or that we are helping understand the value and, and include essentially uh, processes and, 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 and laws and, and, and regulations and um, and sometimes you know uh, it goes as low level as having accounting teams and accounting firms that can actually support businesses who want to accept crypto who might have to pay taxes on, on, on stable coins so you can see essentially that it ranges from infrastructure providers lawmakers um, you know, the issuers uh, might be the on and off ramps, that might be the companies um, that provide ledgering as a service off chain. Um, there's obviously on chain infrastructure. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of different partners, uh, you know, working together to, to make this a reality. And at the core of it, stablecoin payments, you know, really fall into two buckets. The first one is, let's call it wallet to wallet crypto to crypto, so wallet on one end sending to wallet on the other end. Wallets on both sides can be uh, institutional, they can be custodial uh, for retail, they can be custodial for businesses, they can be self-custodial as well. Uh, there's a pretty broad range, obviously, of types of wallets, and we're seeing it kind of like expand over time. Something that is also uh, obviously pretty relevant is getting fiat into stable coins and getting stable coins into fiat, right? Commonly called on-ramp and, and off-ramping. And the sources or the destinations on the fiat side are actually pretty broad, right? Different types of banks uh, and, and banking partners. Uh, that can be also different types of cards. We are seeing a lot of uh, evolution towards prepaid cards as well, not just credit and debit. And so that's something that um, you know, can, can increase in complexity, but at the end of the day, really falls into these two buckets. So let's dive, you know, in order to understand a little bit more about the challenges that we face, it's pretty important to understand the anatomy of these two flows, focusing on the first one. So you would have a person or a business that would be uh, leveraging either directly or via a service provider. Um, as I mentioned, a self-custodial wallet, uh, uh, an institutional uh, custodian wallet, or an embedded wallet that is kind of sometimes referred to as wallet as a service, and then same thing on the other side, whether as a recipient or a, as a sender. On the other side, the way fiat to crypto and crypto to fiat works is more complex, right? So we have a person and a business, uh, or a person and a, or a business that want to uh, essentially send to potentially themselves or someone else, person or business. And on the crypto side, obviously it's kind of the same setup. There's still someone that has a wallet and that will interface with the on-ramping um, provider. The on-ramp will have its own wallet, interact essentially with exchanges and stable coins that can either provide liquidity and convert uh, back and forth, or mint and, and redeem. And on the fiat side, um, the on-ramp provider will actually have a banking partner. And the way this, is, this relationship is actually set up what is in the US is um, called an FBO account for benefits of. The on-ramp will actually have a special type of account that is actually used, um, dedicated essentially for uh, 
the, the, the holding assets on behalf of other businesses, on behalf of other people. Uh, this is uh, required to actually s separate and silo the assets of the users uh, of the service and the assets of the uh, on-ramp provider, the own company, right? And that is oftentimes required for regulatory reasons and protection of, of customers. And the on-ramp is generally facing some type of um, some type of fintech, some type of bank, and sending essentially those assets, whether that's through ACH, SEPA, SWIFT, and so on, uh, and potentially also having um, you know those assets sent to a credit card or a debit card um, owner. So now that we've mapped this out, we need to generally understand why is it so hard to build? Why aren't we seeing more growth? Why are we seeing on-ramping and off-ramping that is still so expensive? And the reality is that you know, just for the wallet-to-wallet -wallet flow, which is a lot simpler, there are uh, a lot of things to take into account. The first one is UX. I believe that the, the speaker right before me was also building, just like us, a wallet solution that needs to take into account UX, right? You need to make it, um, you really want to make wallets feel like the modern internet. I don't think that anyone likes to, to, to click a bunch of different pop-ups and uh, you know, see uh, different uh, gas fees and, and, and data essentially that might be associated to uh, more complex systems, right, than my family member uh, would be used to. So we, we think about UX first. Second, we think about security. Obviously, everyone wants to be safe. No one wants to have to think about whether their money is still going to be there tomorrow. And then finally, regulatory compliance, right? That generally doesn't apply to the self-custodial wallets, but definitely does apply to embedded wallet solution and institutional custodian. And so in this setup, the part that is actually pretty important is having uh, a path to uh, be regulated as an institution. And we can see that in the case of on and off ramps, it's actually much worse. You can see that all the parties essentially that are part of the flow, both on the fiat side and on the crypto side, are actually all uh, regulated. They all need money transmitter licensing. They need banking licensing that might require broker-dealer licensing and all forms of uh, trading activity licenses um, to be able essentially to support this type of flow. And obviously, the bank being at the core of it. So we can see that there's a lot of complexity across the board, both from a security standpoint and a regulatory compliance standpoint. Very hard to get access uh, to FBO accounts, which I'm going to touch it in, in a second. And it actually goes very, very deep. And there are a lot of issues that are happening right now that very few people are aware of. The first one is that regulations uh, are extremely complex and fragmented. Like I just show here four different ones, whether that's Europe, US, Singapore, Japan, with four different completely different frameworks, all different, right? So if you want to be just like us, a regulated wallet provider, you need to go talk to every single one of these um, regulators. Even in the US, you have to register with every 50 state regulators independently. Very complex. Secondly, there is something that is actually happening in the banking as a service, nothing to do with crypto, just on the fiat side. Uh, that is pretty, uh, that is extremely impactful and will redefine how fintechs actually interact with banks when I mention FBO accounts. This setup is changing dramatically. And today, only one US bank actually accepts to onboard um, fintechs for FBO accounts. It's extremely hard essentially to, to onboard. Third, we're seeing essentially a lot of complexity around yield-bearing stablecoins as securities. The problem here is that yield-bearing stablecoins have a tremendous amount of, create a tremendous amount of incentives for businesses who want to, um, you know, receive yield on all the stablecoins that they hold, right, to share a little bit of the money that the reserve uh, holder might make. But obviously, it is deemed a security, at least in the U.S. and under the, the EU rules. And so both of them are actually making it illegal for the vast majority of typical regulated wallets to hold those assets. Generally in the US, you need a completely different type of licensing, whether that's a bank charter or whether that's a broker-dealer license, which is extremely hard. And everyone knows that the SEC is uh, pretty complex to work with these days on the crypto side. 
So last slide, just wanted to go over what I think, um, you know, and, and what I see as kind of like a path forward to tackle those, those three things. The first one is let's start small. Let's start small. Let's get adoption, prove value, essentially, to a lot of these businesses, really show that we are reducing the fees for massive transactions globally, and then use that as a proof point to have larger companies leverage stable coins. We're seeing that with PayPal, we're seeing that with Stripe, we're seeing that with many other companies. Second, we want to make sure that we focus, and as I mentioned, you know, starting small, we want to be very focused on the global corridors that are actually the most expensive and the slowest, right? This is where we will bring the most value, and we're seeing that mostly between US and LATAM, US and uh, the EU, and US and Africa. A tremendous amount of B2B uh, activity, tremendous amount of P2P activity, and there's a huge market need for it. So let's focus on that, and let's have proof points. And finally, let's ensure that we have regulatory compliance to increase the comfort from regulators and banking partners. It's extremely important. FTX, unfortunately, and Prime Trust have hurt the industry tremendously, and now regulators and banking partners, we actually are going over a lot of the due diligence you know, with some of the regulators. It's extremely hard, and it takes you know, sometimes three, four, five months of due diligence from those parties. So really, I think that if we have you know, those three things are, are the most important for us to remember. Uh, start small. Let's get adoption. Let's focus on where we bring the most value. And third, let's build the safe ecosystem that will make regulators and banking partners more comfortable so that we can be more connected to the fiat ecosystem. Thank you so much, everyone.